Hello and welcome to Topic 8. Woo! Topic 8. We made it. Um, this is unfortunately not going to be a fun topic. Uh, this is very, very molecular. It is very dense in the information that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, this specific set of notes is based on metabolism and we'll go into uh, detail again about enzymes. You've, you've learned a lot about enzymes already, but this is just a little bit more. Um, but the next two topics, unfortunately, um, are very information dense and it is, yeah, um, it's not my favorite. <laughs> okay, so I hope that gets you pumped. <clears throat> But let's dive right into metabolism itself. So what is metabolism? Um, it is just the sum total of all reactions that occur uh, within an organism to maintain life. This is literally just any chemical reaction that happens within your body. Uh, not just in humans, but any living organism. Most chemical changes result from a series of reactions with each step controlled by a specific enzyme. It's massively controlled. Um, there is no way to like, oops, accidentally I'm gonna do this. No, the enzyme needs to be there, be ready to perform the reaction, and will only perform the reaction if the enzyme prior to it performed its reaction appropriately. It's very, very specific. So there are two typical ways that we organize these series of reactions. You can do it as a chain, which is kind of what you see below this A, B, C, D, you have one, then the other, then the other, then the other, right? Um, glycolysis is an example of this in cellular respiration, as is the coagulation of uh, your blood when your blood clots. So the formation of like a scab or the, your blood, like coagulation means like sticking together. So when your blood stops like free flowing out of your, cut or whatever, uh, that is due to the coagulation cascade. So you can have a chain or you could have a cycle. And a cycle is just something that is repeated over and over again, like what you see in EFG. So the products of D, whatever D is in this case, uh, will go into the cycle and it will just continuously perform its role um, in a circle. So an example of this is the Krebs cycle in cell respiration and the Calvin cycle in photosynthesis. Uh, we will learn about both of those in detail in the upcoming set of notes. So activation energy. When you are doing something in regards to using an enzyme, creating a reaction, you need a certain amount of energy to be able to proceed to do whatever it is that you are trying to do. So enzymes speed up the rate of reactions by lowering this activation energy. So enzymes work faster because they make it so that you don't need quite as much activation energy to go through the process. So when an enzyme binds to a substrate, and a substrate is just whatever the enzyme is working on, it stresses and destabilizes the bond in the substrate which reduces the overall energy level. So less energy is then needed to convert it into a product, okay? So again, enzyme binds to substrate. Once it binds to the substrate, it sort of like messes with it a little, right? It like destabilizes it. It's like, I'm almost gonna break you. I'm like so close to breaking you. And when it destabilizes it, as much as an enzyme will destabilize the substrate, you need to like, put less force on it to actually break those bonds, okay? So if I like 90% broke a stick in half, it would be very easy to break it the rest of the way to then have two separate sticks, right? That's what an enzyme does. It does a lot of the work so that the overall energy at the end that is needed is significantly lower, so then you can do all of the steps at a faster rate. That's what an enzyme does. Now, there are two models of enzymes and substrates. There's the lock and key, which is all about enzyme specificity, which basically means that the substrate must fit perfectly into the enzyme. And if it doesn't fit perfectly, it doesn't match. And if it doesn't match, it won't do 
anything. They won't meet up. The enzyme will not do anything to the substrate. No product will be formed. So this model, the lock and key model, explains enzyme specificity. The induced fit model explains broad specificity and also explains how um, catalysis may actually occur. So what this is saying is this is probably a better explanation, this induced fit explanation. And basically what it is is if the enzyme uh, action site is close enough, um, then the enzyme will then just change its shape. It will, um, you know, it's, it's pretty close, and then the enzyme will kind of just, like, close up a little bit and actually fit the, the substrate as it should, and then the products will be formed. So although it's not an identical fit, it's very close, and that is the induced fit model. So the induced fit model is, like, kind of more true now that we've been studying it for so long. Um, there is a specificity between enzyme and substrate, but it's not to the extent where it's like one enzyme per substrate. Okay, enzymatic reactions, there are two types. There's exergonic and endergonic. So it depends on if you are releasing heat or you're taking heat in, basically. So exergonic contain more energy than the product. So you start at a higher energy and you end at a lower energy. Um, free energy is released into whatever the system is. So free energy would be released into the human body or into whatever organism it is that we're studying. And this is usually breaking down uh, a substance. So breaking down uh, like a, a carb into its monosaccharides. Um, you would be <clears throat> releasing energy. The opposite, endergonic, is when you are using free energy to build something. So the reactants start with less energy, and then you are taking energy from outside wherever the system is, and you are building something, whatever it is. So this would be like the opposite, going from monosaccharides taking that free energy and building it into a complex carbohydrate. Okay, there are different types of inhibitions when talking about enzymes. Um, so there, you have your normal reaction, right? Substrate goes into enzyme, products are produced. There's competitive inhibition where there is an inhibitor that is the same shape as the substrate, and so it will block the enzyme from being able to bind to the substrate, so no reaction actually occurs. And then there's the non-competitive inhibition where there's an inhibitor, but it doesn't match in on the active site. Where it does match in is somewhere else on the enzyme. So in this case, it is in like the lower left-hand corner, and when it the this inhibitor matches up with the enzyme. What it does is it changes the active site so much that it no longer can match up with the substrate, okay? This secondary site that this inhibitor matches up to is called an allosteric site. So you have your active site, which is like where the substrate typically binds, and then you have an allosteric site, which is a secondary site where an inhibitor could potentially bond. So there are some examples of this in both medicine and agriculture. We have a non-competitive inhibitor example, which is the use of cyanide as a poison. Um, that prevents aerobic respiration. It prevents um, oxygen from uh, turning into a usable form. And then competitive inhibition uh, is one way that we uh, work with the treatment of the flu. So it's kind of interesting. So doing a little bit more about allosterism, this is the modulation of an enzyme's activity via the binding of a secondary item. In this case, an inhibitor in a secondary site, which is the allosteric site. So the inhibitor is here. It's in its own separate site, right? Now there are positive 
versions of allosterism and negative versions. Um, negative versions lead to the inhibition, which is what we talked about on the previous slide. So it makes it so that the enzyme is just unusable. Um, the substrate won't bind to it. It just doesn't work. And then positive uh, leads to activation. So let's look at this for a second. Right here, you have an enzyme. There are two ways that this could go. We could go the positive way, in which case you have uh, a secondary binding happening where it sort of activates the enzyme itself. And you'll see that this active site opens a little bit more when this activator is there. So once that happens, it makes the enzyme actually usable to the substrate. Or vice versa, the negative is you put an inhibitor at an allosteric site, a secondary site, and it prevents the active site from being usable. Okay. There's also feedback inhibition, which is a negative feedback loop that just controls the pathways through end product inhibition. So this is just to make sure that you don't end up with an excess amount of whatever your final product is. Um, and again, it just helps regulate um, exactly how much of each product you're making. So in this case, we have a chain, right? A, a to B, B to C, C to D. You have three different enzymes that are doing jobs. And so when enzyme one does its job, you create B. Enzyme two creates C. Enzyme three creates D. When you have too much of this product being formed, the product itself will go back and inhibit enzyme one from, from working because it says, hey, whoa, 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 we've got way too much product here. I'm gonna need you to slow down, stop breaking down A or whatever it is that it does. Stop doing your job because we've got too much. We need to use some of this final product. And then, you know, once we've used it all, they will stop inhibiting because they'll have been used. And then the enzyme one can go back uh, to continue on in its job. So an example of this is um, isoleucine. So isoleucine is an amino acid that you have to eat. Um, you, it's not made by the body. So this is something that you just need to consciously eat within your diet so that you have this amino acid in your uh, body. And as isole isoleucine is produced, it inhibits the synthesis of theranine. So when you have too much isoleucine, you don't make any more theranine. And so, which is good, uh, because theranine is the initial reactant, right? So you start with theranine and you go through enzyme one, two, right, right, all of these different enzymes and the end product is isoleucine. When you have too much isoleucine or a sufficient amount that you don't need any more, it will go back and bind to enzyme one and prevent theranine from being broken down anymore. Um, if this did not happen, you would basically just use up all of your theranine and then you wouldn't have any theranine in your body anymore and then that would be problematic in its own right uh, because surprise, you need all of the amino acids in your body. They're, incredibly important. Um, and so this is a very, very tightly uh, scheduled process. Um, it's just, it's just so detailed. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. I don't know. I think it's interesting. All right. So let's talk about the kinetics of enzymes. So this is um, some just factors that influence what is happening the rate of enzyme reactions, etc. So the rate of enzymes, uh, the rate of their reaction can be calculated and plotted. And we have looked at this, we have done things like this. So you can measure the time taken uh, to see how much product is formed or how much of the substrate is consumed. Uh, the reaction rate is just the inverse of time taken, 
right? So rate of reaction is one over however long it took to um, form products or whatever it is that you're looking at. And these are different factors that influence enzymes, pH. Uh, there is a specific pH that all enzymes work best at. It is not always the same. It depends on the enzyme. But if it gets too far away from whatever enzyme it is, it will start to denature. Same with temperature. There is a, an optimum temperature that enzymes work at. Anything too hot beyond that will break down the enzyme. Anything too cold will severely slow down the rate of reaction. And then substrate concentration. Eventually, it will be saturated and your amount of reaction occurring will uh, plateau. So inhibitors have an effect on how well your enzyme works. So competitive inhibitors are in direct competition. So it will increase the substrate level because the substrates aren't being used by the enzyme um, so this amount of substrates that are available will increase and the likelihood of an enzyme collision will also increase. Um, and the max rate of an enzyme activity can still be achieved. Um, it will just take a little bit longer. So you see the green is uninhibited. It has a pretty steady growth rate um, and then it will plateau. A competitive inhibitor, it's, a, it's not quite as quick of a growth rate, but it is still... Uh, having quite a bit of reactions um, going on uh, throughout this whole thing. But uh, again, it will eventually plateau. It takes longer, but it'll still do it. And then non-competitive, uh, this will <laughs> increase the substrate rate, but it doesn't matter because the enzymes don't work in this case. Um, so the max rate of enzyme activity is just reduced. Um, so again, you will have some substrates be able to make it into the enzyme, but eventually you're just going to plateau because once those inhibitors match up with the enzyme, like forget about it, you're done. Uh, the enzymes are not working anymore and, you know, they did their best and we have to be proud of them, but we're not happy with, with the amount of reactions happening. Okay, we're going to talk about anti-malarial drugs because IB has some things that are just like you need to know, and this is one of them. Um, so malaria, I'm sure you've heard of malaria, is a uh, parasitic protozoan. So it's a, it's a disease um, caused by a parasitic protozoan, uh, typically through mosquitoes. Um, so the life cycle of this protozoan, which is just like an organism, it's just a, a parasite, basically. Uh, it needs both a human and a mosquito to complete its life cycle. The maturation of the parasite is coordinated by specific enzymes. Obviously, this whole thing is about enzymes. So targeting those enzymes for inhibition is how we get new anti-malarial drugs. We can specifically inhibit those enzymes from going through the process that it needs to go through, which prevents malaria from forming. So scientists have sequenced the genome of this parasite and identified the enzymes involved. And so then they're screened against uh, a database of chemicals and eventually you can find uh, potential inhibitors. And then you can also use computers to model techniques uh, to invent compounds. So there are compounds that exist naturally in the world that could be used as a potential inhibitor, or you could just invent one, um, which I say as if it's like easy peasy, lemon squeezy, but it is not. <laughs> it is very time consuming to invent a compound. Um, I was very nonchalant about it, but it's not. <laughs> it's, it's a process. Um, and so... But it is a possibility um, if this is uh, your line of work and this is what you're studying. Okay, so that is everything for this. Um, we're going to get into cellular respiration next, which is, um, a, is a doozy. So good job. I'm super proud of you. I will see you next time.